Welcome to episode 24, Construction Nation. This is Sue Dyer, your host of Construction Dream Team, where I interview industry leaders and experts so you can learn about the people side of construction and build your construction dream team based on OPE, other people's experiences. The shortest way to success is to learn from others who've already been there and done that. So I hope that you will head on over to iTunes and give Construction Dream Team a five-star rating. This really helps us to have a higher level in the search engine so more of Construction Nation can find us and listen to these great experts and leaders that are sharing their expertise with us on Construction Dream Team. So head on over there and give us a five-star rating and hope that you will subscribe. Well, today we are so lucky to have one of my favorite people. Jim Lithicum is the Director of Mobility Management and Project Implementation for Sandag. And right now, he's heading up a $9 billion capital program. It has all sorts of different types of transportation projects in it. He has been 40 years in the industry this August, so that's quite a milestone, Jim. He was 23 years with Caltrans, and that's when I first met Jim. And now he's been 17 years with Sandeg. So welcome, Jim. Welcome to Construction Dream Team. Thank you very much, Sue. It's great to be with you. So I know that you have had a lot of different jobs over the 40 years. So tell us a little bit about your journey actually become here at Sandeg and heading up the capital program. Well, yeah, I'm glad you said that because I have a very confusing title as <laughs> director of mobility management. Yeah, I am basically I'm the head of the capital program. And like you said, it's very it's a very large program, nine billion dollar multi year, about eight hundred million dollars, eight hundred and fifty million dollars this fiscal year. Man, it's been it's been a quick forty years. And like you said, I started off with Caltrans and as a construction manager. You know, I was a construction inspector. I was then made a resident engineer. And then um, a project manager. And after a project manager, I was the head of construction at Caltrans. And, and now I'm the head of the capital program at Sandag, which is uh, the job I've had for the better part of the 17 years I've been at Sandag. Wow. So, that's, so you've, been, you've been a leader almost everywhere you've gone and everywhere that you've worked. Um, you've, you've had to lead teams and programs and multiple projects. So tell yeah. me a little bit yeah. about what, what you think has made you an effective leader. You know, I, I, let, let me go back to the early part of my career when you're, you're probably the most, most influenced by the, your surroundings, by the, the people that you work with. I take my experience as a, as, a, as a construction manager, both as an inspector and a resident engineer. Those skills are just so applicable to running projects and also running an entire program, yeah, so running a you know a large organization, because it's it's skills that you know decisions have to be made quickly. You have to work with people, the same people day after day after day, and so you learn how to communicate. You learn how to do a lot of things, and you learn and you watch and you see people that do it really really well, and you see people that do it really really poorly. And so if you have your eyes open. And, and, and you'll watch a lot of what's going around, on around you, especially when you're young. You can get a lot of those skills that, will, that you'll, you'll keep with you throughout your entire career as a project manager and as a department head. That's really a, a wonderful perspective that you have because so many people are, are starting in those roles or are moving around in those roles and moving from smaller projects to bigger projects to bigger organizations. And yeah, those, those are the skills you need. And that's totally awesome. I know you and I bonded over being mediators uh, many, many years ago. And I know you've been involved with community <laughs> mediation. And uh, I know I founded a community mediation program too. So, so how do you think that has helped you? Like, like I said, con- construction is a really, it's a fast paced it's a fast-paced job, very thin profit margins, um, especially compared with other industries. And being so fast-paced and having such thin par- profit margins, it, it just causes it just naturally a lot of conflict. And you know, and also it's, it's the nature of a in the public work realm, a low bid, a hard bid contract. Uh, those those are just set up for disputes and they're set up for claims because 
as I, as I had a lawyer once tell me a low bid public works contract is the only contract that's not really a meeting of the minds because you uh, bidders ask questions and you may answer those questions in an addenda to the, the bid, but it's not truly a meeting of the minds. And so it's so considering the profit, considering how fast paced it is, fast paced it is and the nature of the contract itself, it's just set up. And so to be able to come in with a mediator background and with some mediator skills, it just helps make those conversations that much easier. I can imagine because it is it is tough. So, so tell us a little bit about what you see these skills are that you've learned and how maybe how you apply them. Well, there's different models of mediation. And, and the model that I use as part of the organization that I got trained in and I still participate with, it preserves the relationship. So a lot of times you go into a mediation and you the mediator has a, a joint session for anyone that's ever been through one. And then he or she, the mediator, then immediately um, sends you to your separate rooms and they do what's called shuttle diplomacy. Well, that doesn't preserve the relationship because the, the goal of the mediation's that I do, which are then carried over into construction disputes, are you gotta you gotta keep on working together. So you're gonna work together tomorrow, and if not tomorrow on the on the existing job, you gotta work together on the next job. And so you gotta preserve that relationship. So you can't sacrifice that just to get quote a deal. And so that's one skill is how do you do that? How do you how do you make sure you don't it's not personalized by the parties so that you have that so you preserve that relationship between the two parties, let alone between the two individuals? And the second skill is very important is in mediation, you really learn the importance of fully vetting and fully understanding the other side's position to the extent that you need to be able to actually explain their position almost as well as they can explain their position. And when, when you can do those two things, it's amazing how often you can find co- some common ground and a resolution to whatever problem there is. And that's, that's basic mediation. But you can use that just day to day on any type of construction site or any type of construction dispute. Make sure you understand the other guy's side, even if they don't fully understand yours. If you understand theirs, that, you're halfway there right there. And I think that it's important for you to maybe share a little bit on why you think that's important. Because, you know, I see a lot of people on these projects that are pretty entrenched in their own position, and they spend all their time and energy focusing on making their own case instead of understanding what the people they're trying to negotiate with actually need or want. So how, how can they do that? Well, okay, and, and what you what you hit on is exactly what I see every day. When when the, the parties, then the contractor, the, and the owners, rep, the resident engineer are given their positions, what they're really looking for is validation that their that their um, position is correct. That they're so they're going to quote specifications, and they couldn't even though they say they know the other guy's position, they're going to they won't get it right. And so re- really what they're looking for is reassurances that they themselves are right. And so <laughs> you get them to the point where they, uh, I always I have success in any negotiations where I can get them to agree on exactly what they're disagreeing about, on the details of what they're disagreeing about, not just in concept, not just I spend a million dollars and and the contract, that's what the contractor says. And the owner says, well, I don't care that you spend a million dollars. I'm right. No, that's, that's not what we're getting about. It's like, why? Why, why does each party feel it's the other party's either partial or fully res- full responsibility for that cost increase or that time increase? And, and once again, it's a marriage where you can't get a divorce. So you have to take pains to preserve the relationship with all the players so you can continue to work with each other. Yeah, that's so important. I remember uh, many years ago when I was studying at the Harvard Negotiation Program under Fisher and Urey, who wrote the book, Getting to Yes. And I remember them talking about how in Getting to Yes, you know, it was a very popular book, their most popular book, but they wrote the book Getting Together because they realized that about 80% of all negotiations are with people you have a long-term relationship with and you can't afford to just walk away. So that's really how we are in construction. You you have to work together and um, yeah, and 
and agreeing on the problem. I heard you say that basically too. You got to agree on the problem before you can agree on the solution. <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly right. And you can't agree on the problem until you thoroughly know the other person's position, what they're what they're actually what they're actually saying and claiming and, and believe in. And then as soon as you know each other's position that way, then you can come up with a world of ideas of how to get out of the mess. Cool. So if I, if I could just add one other example of that, you know, I, li- I like to tell folks on any construction team, contractor and owner side, that there are so many things that you can do for the other person that it's almost free to you. Contractors, they have tons of equipment on a job. And so there are things that would cost them very little that could really help you out. Likewise, is the owner's position. You know, you wrote the specs, you got the permit, the environmental permits. They can, they can just either really, really help a contractor, really, really hurt a contractor. And so if you could go and you could get like an extended work window, an environmental permit, or traffic windows, if you can do that for the contractor, these are things that are almost free to you and are just priceless to the other party. And you do things like that to the other side, and you're going to increase credibility, and you're going to help those 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 difficult conversations. You're going to help those along. I always think about too. Uh, what's the value of goodwill on a project? You know, rather than fighting, what about thinking about actually creating goodwill? Because I think right. it's so invaluable. Yeah. Yeah, you create goodwill, and then you increase trust, and you increase trust. Then you're going to be listening to each other better. So lots, lots of benefits. Lots of benefits there. I'm sure you have some projects where you maybe have an, a sample of where you've used this before. A little example for us. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. Let, let me just. You know, some of these are pretty long, complex. Let me. Let me give you an example of a fairly short one. It has to do with interests and positions. And so we had a contract. We led a contract where the contractors, the, the bidders, were allowed to work within so many feet of uh, live traffic. And, but it was conflicted in the, in the plans and specifications. So it said one thing, it's a, it said one number one place, another number another place. So the contractor said, well, I bid it for the closest number. Let's, let's say 10 feet. I can get within 10 feet. And the resident engineer is saying, I'm just making this up because I don't remember the exact numbers. So let's say 20 feet. Uh, the specifications say 20 feet. And so they're disagreeing on what the contract says, is it 10 feet or 20 feet. And they're arguing, 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 and that's their positions. But what's their interest? Their interest is the same. Their interest is to do the work safely, safely for the public um, and safely for the contractor. And so what do they really need? And so once they come up with what they really need, and let's just split the difference, say they only need 15 feet. If they can get within 15 feet of traffic, then they're good. Then you know, then that's that's coming with a settlement, and that's doing something that's not costing either party any money. And if you develop those types of solutions before the money's spent, then you're not arguing over anything. Basically, it's where we all get into trouble is when you keep on having that argument after the money's spent. So let's say the the owner's rep um, says, "Okay, nope, it's twenty feet, and the contractor has to bring in new equipment." Because they have to stay 20 feet away and they, that costs them money. Well, now you're just arguing over the money after the work's already done. Mm-hmm. But if you can, if you can have that conversation before the work is done and, and focus on what your int- what each side's interest is, then you're going to be able to solve the problem amicably. And you know, once again, this is a simplistic example, but you can use that type of example lots and lots and lots of places. So tell me from your point of view, where and how you implement this within your own program. So what, what happens to somebody, does it percolate up to you and then you help or do you help, uh, give, help these skills or credit tone or credit culture or, or all of the above? Well, I'm, I'm a little bit removed from the field operations. And so there's a couple of layers between me and a, and a resident engineer. But I think that I can tell you all, my, all of my staff knows that I, um, I'm a volunteer mediator on the, um, on, the, on the side. I do that as a community mediation, some business mediations, but mostly community mediations. And so they hear me ask questions like, well, what's the other guy say? And I say, no, no, no. Come on. You think, you know, and so they might give me what they think the other guy's saying. I'll say, no, nah. you need to tell me he can't come up with a better argument than that. 
And so I keep on pressing them. What's the, you know, what is the other guy's position? And so when you hear that, and I've had this job for a long time, and, and luckily I have a very stable uh, uh, workforce staff here. So most people, you know, we all know each other pretty well. So that's more of the culture thing. But we also use, just based on the, the, the model that I have set up at Sandike here, we're a project management-based organization. So I have project managers and higher-level construction managers for staff, and then we contract out um, all the, let's say, the, the design effort and uh, the field effort, so inspection and testing and resident engineers. And so I have conversations with all of our um, the principals, my counterparts of these companies. And so they all know my philosophy too. And so you, you get that from the top, you work together. And I, I think it's an easy concept to grasp because A, it's you're more successful doing it this way. And B, it's a it's a better job. It's a it's a more fun job if you're all working together. And and probably the worst thing that happens is is I will have engineers come back to me and say, well, you know what, I'm playing that game, but the other guy's not meeting me halfway. And so if I, you know, we try to give it another chance. And if I have to, I reach out to my counterpart on the contractor side and we have a conversation. And so that, that's going to happen once in a while. We've got a lot of projects and a lot of work. So everything is not going to be perfect. But if you go, if you attack it from that type of culture, I think you'll find that it is much more enjoyable, much more profitable for all concerned. Yes, I agree. I agree with that completely. So tell me a little bit about where you think someone might go to get some mediation skills. Well, you know, you, you, you were trained or you have areas up where you are. I went to an organization called the uh, National Conflict Mediation, or excuse me, National uh, Conflict Resolution Center and um, NCRC. And and NCRC, it's, it's right in San Diego, but they do trainings uh, nationally, and in fact, also in some foreign countries. And if you if you tick, click on their tab on their on their website and look under training, you can see the services that they provide as far as training. And it's you know, I I was trained 20 years ago as a mediator. You don't need to take the training as a mediator. They have training basically in those same skills that I've been talking about that are more of a quick and easy, you know, a down and dirty half day type training. They'll, they'll teach a lot of this. And that's, that's NCRC. Let me give you their website. It's ncrconline.com. ncrconline.com. And we'll and put that into great... the show notes. Great. Thank you very yeah. much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So everyone will find that. Yeah. And I know that uh, some states have community-based mediation programs and they have training. There's also the National Conflict Resolution Association where you can get training. There's also some universities that have conflict resolution certifications, mediation training, mediation certifications. So really, if you Google, I'm sure wherever anybody is, they can probably find some type of training they could get. And I'm assuming there's probably some online but I think you learn the most from actually doing it. <laughs> like we do a court one every, we're in the courts three days a week and we do same day court mediation. So the mediators were training, go through the training and then they actually mediate cases in the court. So they learned yeah. kind, of, kind of fast. <laughs> and in fact, that's how I learned. It was in small claims court in San Diego about 20 years ago. And you have about oh, 45 minutes to an hour to mediate this dispute. Yes, that's been going on maybe for years. Yes. Yeah. 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 So that's exciting. And I do think that mediation skills are just so potentially tremendous for anybody out there that really wants to create the kind of culture that creates the kind of success that Jim is having. And so, yeah, seek it out. Tell us a little bit about Sandag and your construction program. Well, it, it's a big old program. Like I said, $9 billion multi-year program. It's, it's light rail. In San Diego, we call our light rail the trolley system. Um, and it's also heavy rail, so commuter rail, uh, freight, and Amtrak. So light rail, heavy rail, something that's kind of new. Bus rapid transit, which is simulates like light rail, except it's on rubber tires. So that's BRT. And we also have freeway projects. And so the major freeway projects in San Diego are all funded through Sandag's uh, capital program and through our uh, special sales tax. 
And so that's also in our capital program, although we hire Caltrans to deliver all of those. All of the, um, the, the transit projects we deliver in-house, and I have, like I said, I have project managers and construction managers, but I contract out the design, the environmental, the inspection, the testing, resident engineers, folks, things like that. And then Caltrans, uh, coincidentally, has a 180-degree different model. They do almost all of their work in-house. And so you'd think, well, there, right there, that's going to create conflict. But now, nah, now nah, we have worked at that relationship with Caltrans and they've worked at the relationship with us for years and years and years. And it is an incredible relationship. We are truly one team. That's awesome. And yeah, it's, it's, we're very proud of that. And then something we've gotten into in the past half dozen years or so, and that's alternative procurement. You know, traditionally, when my time at, at the state at Caltrans and also early on in Sandag, it was just pure low bid construction work. But a few years ago, we went out with our first two design build projects. And right now, we're doing our first construction manager general contractor job, CMGC. Some people know it as uh, CM at risk. So those are our first two or our first job. And we also have another one in our program that Caltrans is administering, and they're doing their first. CMGC project in San Diego. So we have the vast majority of our projects are low bid, but the majority of our dollars are alternative procurement. That's awesome because uh, one of the research that we've done and that I was just talking with Dodge Data and Analytics about is that the sooner you can bring like your collaborative processes together and you have the opportunity to in design, build, and CMGC. This definitely the more impact you have, the more benefit you have for the team working together. So that's awesome. Exactly. So I know you have a two point two billion dollar light rail project right now. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that's a pretty big project. Yeah, that is pretty big, and that's the um, that's the biggest thing we've ever done in San Diego as far as transportation goes. And, you know, highway or rail, by far the largest. And we're doing that by CMGC. And I'll tell you, that was not our intent because we, it took us a long time to actually get state legislation to allow us to use CMGC. And my goal was to try this out, test our methods and our processes and our specifications on a much, much smaller project. But the timing didn't work out for the legislation. And so we are testing it, our very first CMGC project on a $2.2 billion job. And it is going great. It is, it is, and I'm not exaggerating, it's the highest performing team I've ever been associated with in almost 40 years. It's a wonderful job and a wonderful team. And we're halfway there. We had a halfway party for all the workers at uh, 6, 6.30 a.m. Um, on one, um, one weekday morning last month. Um, just to celebrate the workers and everything they've done. And there's on a typical day, there's about 600 workers on that job, 11 mile long project. So it's going well. And that's one of the things, right? That's one of the things you always read, but you hardly ever do is you, you got to find time to celebrate. <laughs> we Absolutely. had, we had ourselves a, a heck of a celebration. And okay. then um, just over the weekend, Saturday morning, we, the, the team had a topping out ceremony just like they do with a high rise, except they did it with the last um, precast girder that got set out of 144. They, they had a topping out ceremony at, at about 2 a.m. Because that's when it went up. Uh, so <laughs> those cool. celebrations go a long ways. So tell us a little bit about how your CMGC is working. I know there's lots of different flavors on kind of how it works. So this is the most successful project you've kind of ever seen. What are you seeing that is different and unique or that you think is really making it so successful? Oh, yeah. There's, and this is the reason why I'm, I'm so sold in the process after just uh, one or two jobs. And so we brought the contractor on board for pre-construction services probably about a year and a half prior to the start of construction. If, the, if we had the ability, we would, in, in, in hindsight now, we would have done that sooner, bring, brought them in substantially sooner than when we did because the value you get from them. Because what they do in CMGC, I as the owner at Sandex still own the design, but I have the contractor there assisting us is on constructability and what's the cheapest way to build something and uh, the fastest way to build something. And we're a pretty sophisticated group. And so a lot of, a lot of folks say, you know what, what if, they're, what if they're driving you as the owner? What if they're driving you to something that is more expensive but just works, in, just works for them? 
Well, you know, it's we're 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 in the major leagues of contracting, and so we don't think we got we don't. In fact, we're pretty confident that that never happened. But what we did was we also brought in experts, and so our contractor had done CMGC before, but Sandag never had. And so what we did was we had joint training sessions with the contractor. So before work started, and we called them, they were day-long classes, and we called them CMGC 101, and the next one was CMGC 202, where everybody could um, could learn from experts, ask questions, and also have a little fun and get to know each other. And that helped a lot. The profit margin, that was, that was all part of the, what they bid when they got it. And we set a minimum profit margin of 5%. It couldn't bid less than 5%. And, and so just having the profit margin bid was very, very helpful. So there's training, there's profit. Oh, executive buy-in. We've had regular sessions with the, the principals from each of the construction companies that are in the joint venture and the principals from Sandag. And, and some, and some of the other stakeholders, like we're going through a world known university and university of California, San Diego. So meetings with them, meetings with Caltrans as the DOT, since we spend a lot of time in the Caltrans right of way and having all the execs be on the same page. And the execs on this team do not accept, uh, failures to communicate as a, as a reason that, that something is done wrong or something, you know, we're still having an argument or there's tension created on the job. And I think the last thing that we did that I can think of that we did right was even before the contractor got on board, as we were drafting our specifications, um, we sent our staff to a couple of different transit agencies that have done CMGC and done them successfully. So the lawyers could talk to their counterparts on, you know, on, on the legal aspects of the contract and the engineers could talk to their counterpart and the, the CMs could talk to their counterparts. And, and you get sort of educated that way. So not only do you come up with some with best practices, but now you got somebody at another agency that you can call and email and say, hey, this came up. What about that? So you're, you're making connections that way. So lots, lots and lots of positives going on here. Sounds like there's lots of lessons learned there, too. I love the idea yeah. of the joint training. I know that was something at the Harvard negotiation program they highly recommended. And we've done that in Caltrans for years, too, as you recall. Do, yes. Yeah, and setting yeah, the know, tone. Yeah. Yeah, you, you set the tone. And you have, you have the bosses right there. And you, you hold their feet. You, you have the bosses hold their staff's feet to the fire. But, you know, and, and speaking of the staff, and this is something you get the luxury of a mega project like this, that you're going to get some of the best and brightest on both sides. And so that really helps. And so when you look for the best and brightest on jobs like this, you look for somebody that, that maybe can think a little different. They can maybe think a little out of the box. You're not going to put people on a job like this, you know, a CMGC job that are just only comfortable in a low bid world. They're only comfortable arguing. And we all know in this industry, there's people like that out there. And so you don't put those people on jobs like this. You want folks that can just be a little bit different and, and than, than a hard bid world, working this model just a little bit better. Well, I was thinking too, you have some flexibility even in the way that you're structured because you can, you have more selection of the people at the field level and some of the people that might be designing. You can create cohesion amongst your own people. And then you can kind of hand pick who you think will fit for the kind of culture you're trying to create. Yeah, that, is, that's is, exactly is awesome. right. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's really awesome. Well, congratulations on that. That's very exciting. And you know, in transit, it's not the norm. So it's no, it's awesome. no, it's not. It, yeah, it's more the norm for for vertical construction, and it's and that's where it gets its name from because the the prime you know a lot of times in vertical construction the the primary role of the of the contractor is to be the construction manager where you're hiring and you sub out almost everything. But that's not that way in transportation, heavy civil type construction. No, that's not. It's a very different animal. So I know for you, you've had different jobs and different roles over the past 40 years. And not everything has gone perfectly, exactly as you had hoped. What is the biggest challenge you've ever faced in your career? Take us back to that very worst moment. <laughs> okay, so put all this this good feeling stuff aside, right? Okay. 
I had a project, and I was with Caltrans at the time. I was the head of construction for the San Diego office. And, and this, is, this is a project example. And we were retrofitting a, a freeway-to-freeway interchange. And not only was it a freeway-to-freeway interchange, but it was a viaduct. So it was a, about 180 feet in the air. And I'm retrofitting it for earthquakes. And so the way the, the contractor, the way the design was, the contractor put a rebar cage around each column, each of the dozens and dozens of columns, and then welded the rebar cage together, welded the hoops together, and then poured a concrete sleeve around it. So it sounds easy enough. We just do the same thing over and over and over and over again. So we were about halfway through the project, maybe a little bit more, and there were 80,000 rebar welds on, on the project at that time. And we found out that both the, we found out that the vast majority of those welds were uh, deficient in, in how the welding was, and the vast majority of all the welds were also already encased in concrete. So we we found that out by some of the welds we were um, radiographing, which is you know, similar to an X-ray, and we found that out of the welds, and we start chipping away at some of the um, the concrete where the welds where the rebar was already encased. We found a similar situation there. And so the decision was made to just start over on all 80 some thousand welds, get ready to blast off all the concrete, take off all the rebar, and re weld them. It turns out that what, what the subcontractor was doing was they were using a different density of film for the radiography. And so it, it was foggy and fuzzy enough where you couldn't quite see the defects. And then when we went in and, 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 um, and radiographed ourselves, we could clearly see the defects and we proved it over and over and over again. And so the, uh, I got the FBI involved. It got the, um, the DOT, the federal DOT inspector general involved. And so it, it was, it was pretty tense. It, that sounds and, pretty and tense because you're a mediator. <laughs> yes. I, I, wow. That's a, in fact, the timing is interesting because um, I wasn't a mediator at the time, but I was quite interested in the subject at the time, but it, yeah, it ended up in a multi-million dollar dispute. I think this is, a, this is about 23, 24 years ago. And back then it was, uh, I think a 17 or $18 million dispute. That would, that would be a 50 or $60 million dispute today. Yeah. So that's, that's, that, that was probably the biggest project challenge. And did you learn something from it that you have <laughs> taken with you? <laughs> yes. Yes. It's interesting because most welding, at least for Caltrans and my experience, Caltrans statewide was always done in a shop where you had um, a great control over the, um, the welding process. And so defects just weren't that big of a deal. When you ship that to the field and you get a, a subcontractor who was um, trying to cut corners and you had a in-house staff that, that weren't experts in things like this. Yeah, it was a, it was a recipe for disaster, which is what happened. And so as, as a consequence of that, you know, the state of California being a pretty big player, the specs nationally for that type of thing done in the field have changed. So that's a positive. And, and there was, and I, I don't want to say who the, who the players were, the contractors were, but I think that the, the, this could have been settled much sooner had the general contractor, the prime contractor, who had absolutely nothing to do with this, had come to us and said, hey, we agree there's a problem. What are we going to jointly do about it? But instead, the prime contractor actually had the, the crews, their crews as the prime, speed up how fast they were encasing the welds because they thought there was no way we would ever make them chip out all that rebar. And so I think that, would, I think that was a mistake. And I'll take some ownership of that. If, if I had a better relationship with my counterpart, that with the with this out of town contractor, it wasn't that we didn't have a. It wasn't that we had a bad relationship. We just didn't have much of a relationship. I think if that trust level had been there from the start, and I had called him up, and he and he trusted my word, I think I think he would have maybe taken a different attitude. And so you know, it's it's just it's that whole it's the whole things that comes from mediation and communi- and good communication and a well run job, is that when. When I get a call from my counterpart, the contractor, I pretty much know that something's um, you know, something's going wrong. They're not just trying to 
make up a dollar that they blew in their estimate. They're not going to call me unless something's really gone south. And when they say, could you please investigate? I do. And vice versa. When I call up my counterpart and I just say, hey, could you look into something? Something doesn't smell quite right. Something's gone wrong. And I'm not saying it's your guy or my guy or whatever. But if I ask them to do that, they usually do. And, and we can usually get things solved. And so, the, you know, that, that communication with, uh, you know, with your counterpart at an exec level is just critical. You got to have that kind of relationship. Yeah. And not let it, you know, fester. Yeah. Keep it, keep maintaining those relationships is so important. It's so easy yeah. to do when it, when it's good and then so hard to do when it's bad. <laughs> so, well, yeah. and it's hard to do when it's bad. So that's, therefore you have to start from day one when everything is good. Exactly. Yeah. So you build up, you have that relationship, you build up some trust. Yeah. Yes. So what's the best advice you've ever gotten? Ah, the way I staff work and organizationally, I just try to be as flexible can be as can be and be as nimble, be as nimble with your resources and your processes, right? Because I'm, I'm a, a working government. I have had my entire career. And so government processes tend not to be very nimble. Those processes you want to see, you want to have everybody do them the same way every time. Also with resources, they say, well, if you're at a certain level in your organization, you should be working on this type of project or you're that level. I believe in being way more flexible, way more nimble. And I had, I had someone um, tell me a uh, pretty seasoned professional years and years and years ago when I was like a young, uh, young manager. And his quote was, says, you don't see the Dallas Cowboys run the same offense regardless of who they have at quarterback. <laughs> but you see companies and especially public agencies do that with how they run jobs and, it's how, and what the processes are set up for. And that's crazy. You need to take advantage of the talents of the team. So that's the resources. And you need to have processes set up that suit the project. And you do that, and you're going to be way, way more nimble. And will allow you to do way more things concurrently. Because the one thing I hate about bureaucracies is how bureaucracies tend to do things very sequentially. So first you do have to do A, then you do B, and then you do C. And if it turns out A wasn't quite right, you start over again. Well, there's a lot of things you can do concurrently. And never is that more applicable than on a construction job. And so if you think something's going to, let's say you have a value engineering proposal and you think that sounds good, well, start negotiating the costs, start doing the paperwork, start getting all the approvals while your designer is looking at it. And the same thing, with, let's say, with RFIs or with um, submittals, shop drawings and things like that. If they're routine and they start to look good, and you have a good history with, let's say, the, the contractors, engineers, or the project managers for the contractor, you know, do things concurrently and not everything sequentially. Be nimble that way. You will not only improve the uh, project, but you'll improve your relationships. That sounds like great advice for all. So do you have a gift for us, just from something that you can leave for us to, uh, to learn more from? Let's see. Learn more from. There's something that I've told new supervisors and new managers for years and years and years. And that is you spend a lot of time in meetings. You spend a lot of time on the phone. You read a lot of email. What to observe what leaders do. So observe what they do that you think is particularly effective. So what do they do? What don't they do? You know, and just take some notes and then see if that fits into your particular style. Because it's important it has to fit into your style. Because if it doesn't, then it's going to come across as phony. So it needs to fit your personality. But what do effective leaders do and don't do? And then also it can be almost as beneficial. Look, watch in meetings and in any type of communication. Watch what people do that's particularly not effective. And why wasn't it effective? And why did it create additional anxiety or, you know, you know it, it was a failed strategy or a failed attempt to try to get something done? And, and also learn from that. So just observe leaders that you're around every single day and watch them, especially when you're fairly new. 
Cool. That that sounds like great advice. Thank you. So sure. we usually ask everyone to leave a, a resource of some sort for people. Do we have a resource that you would want to share with the construction? Um, let's see. Well, I can tell you, I, can, I, I first got to know this woman named Sue Dyer by, by your book, Sue, Partner Your Project. It's still on my bookshelf. That book is what, over 20 years old now? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we got to know each other on the uh, Caltrans statewide partnering steering committee, too. So uh, that's right. A couple rounds on that, too. So that was uh-huh. great. That's right. And there's also a, another book that I've, I've always liked, and that's a book called Leadership is an Art. And it's by a guy named Max Dupree. And his whole thing is, the leader slash servant, you know, you sort of define, you sort of set the goals for the team and, and you tell them, you know, where the end zone is. And then you, after that, you're, you get out of the way and you're a servant to them. And I think that's very, I think that's a very, very effective way of, of leading talented teams. That's awesome. Um, and so that would be the, your, your book, Partnering Your Project and Leadership with an Art by Max Dupree is, um, are two good resources of mine. And we will put both of those books as links on in the show notes for this episode. So you can check them Excellent. out there. So what do you, do you have a favorite piece of tech that you like that really helps you? Tech, technology. Yes, I have an, I have an app on my phone that's called Headspace. And Headspace is, a, instead of mediation, Headspace is a meditation app. And it, it just really promotes mindfulness and a lot of things you see going these days. You know, it's so interesting to see professional organizations like uh, CMAA, the Construction Management Association of America, have sessions. You know, you think these, these grizzled, hard-nosed folks that are working in the construction industry um, using meditation techniques. And so Headspace is a great one for me and, you know, practice mindfulness. Um, so that's, that's one. And the other one, I don't use these, but I use what comes out of them are drones. Oh my goodness. Drones are the best thing to happen for construction sites ever because you can see up and around jobs almost in real time. If we have a job, if we have a drone on a, on a project and we do on most projects these days, they're so cheap. That's awesome. So I know John Martin did an episode, I think I believe it's episode number five on uh on meditation. So that might be something uh, others might want to check out as well. And uh, drones. Yes. Yeah, so we're going we're gonna to have somebody here that we're going to be talking to around drones here pretty soon. Cause I'm, I'm seeing year to year, the orders of magnitude change and what people are able to use drones for. It's just, it's exponentially growing. They're getting more and more sophisticated and uh, cheaper and easier to use. So that's great to, great to hear that you guys are using that. That's wonderful. Yes. Yeah. So how can people get a hold of you? Well, probably the best way is, is on LinkedIn. So it just if you're, if you're going to have my name spelled in show notes, it's just Jim Linthicum. Now, surprisingly, there's a whole bunch of Jim Linthicums in LinkedIn, but I'm the only one that works for Sandag, S-A-N-D-A-G. And so look, look for me on LinkedIn. You can message me that way, and I'd uh, love to have a conversation with you. And we'll put uh, a link to your LinkedIn also on in the show notes so people can find you oh, there too. Even better. So what is your parting advice for Construction Nation? Something that maybe people could start doing tomorrow to maybe take a more of a mediator leadership role? Look, everybody appreciates being listened to. And everybody knows it when they are talking and... The other person is just waiting for you to take a breath before they start talking. So you know they're not listening to you. And we all know when that happens to us. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that it happens that the other person is, it's obviously the other person when you're doing it yourself. And it happens all the time. And so it's so easy just to practice what's called active listening. So you really listen to a person. You really wait till they are done with a thought before you weigh in. 
and you you somehow you try to let them know that you understood what they were saying. That's that's the active listening part. You know, if repeating some back or making sure you're, you say, let me make sure I understand you and you repeat back what you think you heard, you know, you do that kind of thing and you're going to lower barriers. And when you do that, it's also amazing how often the other party does that too. And so then that starts the conversation. And it's, it's something you could actually, that anybody could do tomorrow, this afternoon, anytime, anytime you would like to. Works, it's especially effective at home. <laughs> Sounds like wise words. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank, I thank you so much, Jim, for being a guest on Construction Dream Team. This is a great episode, and I know it will help many people and inspire people to you know take on mediation as a skill set. And that will be wonderful for the industry. So I really appreciate you being here. Oh, you're very welcome. It was my pleasure. Okay, Construction Nation, this was a great episode. Please share it with your entire team so they can help you create the atmosphere that you need for success and to have a dream team. Remember, dream teams don't just happen. They're built one step at a time. And I hope that you will go to constructiondreamteam.com and click the resources button. We have had so many great people on here over the past several months and everyone always shares their favorite resources and we have accumulated all of those on the resource page so take a look and find look at these resources that people have uh, created for us and if you're not a member of audible go ahead and click on the audible link that's on the resource page and we have a deal for you a free book so any of the books on the resource page you can get for free from uh, audible so check that out and if you're not a member you got it you got 30 days free and a free book and uh, there's many many really awesome resources on the resource page from videos and links and there's all sorts of things so check that out and I hope that uh, you will remember that Construction Dream Team drops every Monday morning at 4 a.m. Pacific time. So please join me next week when I will interview another industry leader or expert about the people side of construction so you can learn how to create your construction dream team. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome, Sue. And I'll catch you next time.